Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hi everyone, welcome back to the 20th lecture of Spatial Statistics and uh, Spatial Econometrics. This uh, lecture will be the last lecture in the series uh, while we transition to tutorials on RGIS and R. And today's lecture uh, will talk about two broad, you know, concepts. One is the LISA principle and spatial dependence. Uh, test statistics called the Moranzai statistic and the Geary seek uh, statistic. And then finally, we will introduce a little bit of hypothesis testing in the spatial regression models, right? So to do a bit of, uh, you know, uh, recap, uh, we started out this course by looking at a lot of uh, spatial data sources, uh, including the popular ones that are being applied for various contexts. And then we spent some time in developing the idea of spatial dependence formally uh, using, uh, you know, the statistics like the variogram, the covariogram, and, and then we came on to this understanding of spatial interpolation, right? In this journey, we have also uh, figured out the importance of spatial stationarity, uh, without which none of the statistics that we have seen till now including the regression modeling, uh, you know, uh, 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 makes sense if our data are spatially non-stationary, right? So I really encourage you that, you know, going forward, as you apply these tools and, you know, in your respective research problems or, or any type of uh, setting that you apply them, uh, you should give a very hard thought uh, and look to your data and your context and worry about uh, stationarity, right? If you think that you cannot perfectly argue out stationarity, but still you have some ideas of where, in what conditions, uh, you know, the data might be stationary or might not be stationary, those need to be seriously documented whenever you produce such results, right? Um, in this journey, then we have looked at this idea of spatial regressions and we made this transition from regressions uh, as, a, you know, statistical tool to a causal inference tool. Right. Therein, we mobilized this idea of, of reflection problem uh, due to a seminal paper by Charles Mansky. Right. And, and, and from there, we have then, you know, seen Lou Cancelin's uh, sort of a school of analysis using spatial weights and spatial weights matrices in order to conduct spatial regression analysis, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to model spatial dependence through either errors, regression error terms, or as a mean outcome uh, term in the regression model, right? Today, we are going to continue that uh, line of thought and we are going to look at these univariate statistics that you can look at, you can, you can, uh, you know, see them as a counterpart to the variogram uh, uh, model or the covariogram model and, and think of them as an alternative to uh, detecting uh, uh, spatial autocorrelation in data. Right? The fundamental difference between a variogram and a uh, statistic, for example, on your screen, you're looking at this name called the Moranzai statistic, which is a popular statistic to detect, uh, uh, you know, spatial autocorrelation, is the dependence on your weights matrix, right? The dependence on a row standardized weights matrix is what differentiates the Moranzai statistic or the Geary C statistic from what we looked at, the variogram statistic, which is a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, tool in order to document, detect, measure spatial dependence in data, right? So let's begin. So uh, we are going to talk about detecting local spatial autocorrelation based on neighborhood weights in the first part of this lecture. And here, this lecture can be seen as divided into four, three, uh, you know, broad uh, uh, parts. 
The first is called as the LISA principle. LISA is an abbreviation for Local Indicators of Spatial Association and we will we'll go over this in detail in a minute. And then we will look at two popular statistics called the Moran's I statistic and the Geary C statistic. Right? I will just write out the overall aim of this part, you know, of, of lecture 20. So here, the first aim is to identify, identify location of spatial clusters. Okay. And the second is to assess the extent or degree of spatial autocorrelation in data in data and comment upon the statistical significance properties. Right? I mean, signif statistical significance of what? Of the measure of a degree of spatial autocorrelation. That is going to be either the Moran's I statistic or the Geary C uh, statistic. Okay? So, the first thing first, we are going to talk about the LISA principle. Right? So, LISA principle. Okay? As remarked earlier, uh, LISA is short form for local indicators of spatial association. Okay. Uh, now, they deliver a local spatial statistic uh, for each location. So, we can say location based uh, you know, spatial statistics. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to say that. I'm going to modify my last sentence and make it a little bit more concise. Uh, I'm going to say they provide us with um, location specific uh, uh, spatial statistics. All right, and the sum of these location based statistics right sum of these location based i'm going to say lisa statistics provides a measure of global spatial dependence or you know a uh, 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 spatial autocorrelation in data. Okay, so we are trying to make a comment upon global, uh, you know, provide a global statistic. But when we do that, we are going to somehow, you know, through this LISA principle, we are going to have these location based spatial dependent statistics that we will then aggregate over space. And this link between local and global uh, uh, you know, statistical understanding of spatial autocorrelation is where this LISA principle is situated. So, by LISA principle, we will be able to say that the global statistic, when I say global statistic, I mean global statistic for, uh, you know, spatial autocorrelation is going to be equal to k times, k is a constant, times summation of let's say lisa i so a statistic that we evaluate you know you can say a component you know a local statistic at location i right so local meaning location i based right so local statistic for spatial autocorrelation so we'll be working with these Location-based statistics, we are going to fundamentally define location-based statistics and then 
we are going to define them in a way in a, so that we can then sort of aggregate them with a constant uh, you know multiplier and you know formalize a global uh, you know uh, statistic okay so that's about the lisa principle and now two popular statistics based on this principle are the moran's i statistic and the gary c statistic now moran's i is a more uh, you know recent uh, uh, statistic more popular statistics so i'm going to spend a little bit more time on that and uh, you know give you just a gist of the gary c statistic which is based on the same principle so uh, what we discuss for moran's i will also quite a bit of it will apply for gary c but we will also see how they are different and and some uh, you know broad introductory details okay so the moran's i statistic if you want to read it read uh, more about it as i said it is based on spatial weights so it comes from the anselin luke anselin school of thought right so uh, luke anselin was you know has pioneered this idea of using spatial weights for uh, or a weights matrix based you know uh, measure or measurement of spatial order correlation uh, be it for uh, finding a global statistic that we will see now or for modeling through spatial regressions that we have seen in the past uh, you know couple of lectures right okay so the moran's i statistic it is based on uh, you know uh, 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 let's say two uh, you know uh, uh, components okay so two fundamental components of the moran's i statistic is first a row standardized uh, 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 weights that is wij something that we have seen now and you know by consequence you know you can say and a weights matrix okay a weights matrix i'm going to say w tilde because you know previously we saw w is a weights matrix which has a binary 0 1 characterization between whether uh, you know the row representation i are neighbors with column representations j and the row standardization basically normalized for the uh, you know degree of interconnectedness for these uh, you know for these uh, 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 spatial units right so we are talking about row standardized weights and a weights matrix entering these uh, the Moran's I statistic. Now I'm using when I'm introducing I'm saying W tilde, but you know I go, as I go forward just for uh, you know uh, uh, you know just for clarity, if I use W, I'm basically talking about row standardized weights. I'm now never going to talk about non-row standardized weights. And why is that problematic? For that we have to go back to previous lectures and then uh, figure that out. Okay. So second is uh, the second component is the deviation from me. Now that's simple, right? So I'm gonna say this say this is z i, right? So deviation from the mean and a spatial weight are two components uh, that comprise uh, you know a Moran's i statistic. Then uh, Moran's i at location small i okay is denoted as under okay so i have i at location i so capital i represents moran's i then at location i is equal to summation j w i j i'm say tilde so weight row standardized weight z j z i divided by i z i squared okay and of course this location i represents let's say if i had a domain of interest d right if i have a domain of interest d and every location you know if it's a geostatistical domain then you know i know that every location here is a representation of i Right. So, if I have a data set which goes from i to 1 to n, then you know i i is defined for all those uh, locations. Right. Uh, now, given, given that z i is or represents, let's say represents, represents deviation from mean, 
mean uh, uh, we can we have something like an underlying process x such that z i equals x i minus x bar right so that is what uh, you know deviation from mean really means and so i can rewrite i i as summation j w y j x i minus x bar x j minus x bar divided by summation i x i minus x bar the whole square Okay, and I'm again going to say wyj is equal is a tilde. So, you know, uh, we have this entity. Okay, now if you, if you just stop for a minute and pay attention, uh, you know, draw your attention to this last, uh, you know, expression for ii, if we did not have the weights wyj, right, the numerator is a representation for covariance between you know, x at location i and location j. And in a denominator, I am basically normalizing it with the variance of x i, right? So I am in a way writing a correlation metric, right? So a correlation would have been rho summation x minus. So if you if you look at, if you think about the traditional covariance uh, correlation, uh, you know, uh, uh, metric, then you have, uh, uh, you know, rho x y will be summation x minus x bar y minus y bar divided by summation x minus x bar squared f y minus y bar squared and the whole thing square root. When we brought this to the spatial setting and we defined what was called as the correlogram, right? In that scenario, you know, so if I say rho spatial, you can go back and look at the correlogram. There it was C x y over C zero, right? Now, if I remove the weights, all I'm looking at is a correlation metric, right? A correlation, a traditional correlation metric enhanced by spatial weights is the Moran's I statistic, okay? It's as uh, you know, uh, uh, starkly similar as that. Okay, so let's with that thought, you know, develop uh, uh, this, uh, develop this, uh, you know, concept further. So note, okay, so again, notes, we have said this now. Uh, now, uh, you know, xi, I'm going to rewrite the Moran's I statistic for clarity. Let's rewrite it on this page and then move forward. So I have ii. I'm just writing this out from the previous slide. Summation j, w i j tilde, x i minus x bar, x j minus x bar, divided by summation i, x i minus x bar, the whole squared. Okay. Now, you know, notes, uh, x i minus x bar in the numerator, Okay, so I'm talking about this, this term here, right? X i minus x bar in the numerator can be taken out, taken out of the uh, 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 summation operator. Right, why is that? Because the summation is over j, the summation is over j. So with respect to j, xi is a constant. So I don't really sum xi. Once I fix a location i, xi minus x bar is a constant, right? So that means this term can come right out of the summation operator, right? And, and if you look at the numerator, it is itself a constant. It's just, a, you know, a variation, uh, you know, sample variance times and minus one, right? So denominator, is a constant because it doesn't depend on i, you are, you know, integrating i out of the denominator, right? So I'm going to say that. So the first note was that, the second note is the denominator is a constant, right? That is what I'm trying to say is that it does not, does not depend on i, not very hard to see, 
right? So now we will rewrite R Moran's I as Xi minus X bar divided by summation over I Xi minus X bar the whole squared times summation J WIJ tilde uh, XJ minus X bar, okay? This can be then further written as Xi minus X bar is ZI, that's the deviation from the mean, summation over I ZI squared, summation J WIJ tilde ZJ, okay? Now clearly, this term sitting outside the summation j term is a constant, right? We can say a constant a. So then I can write this term as a times summation j w i j tilde z j, right? And as I've mentioned earlier, the Lisa principle, right? I apply the Lisa principle principle, I will now link the local statistic with a global statistic, okay? So let me do that. So I'm going to say summation i, i, i will be equal to n times i, it can be seen as a n i, okay? So as if I am summing n times i's, you know, at each location. So if, if the local correlation was a, a constant at each location, I can, I can think about, you know, uh, a global average being capital I and n times that local, uh, you know, global average is going to give me the sum of each individual unit providing me a correlation, uh, you know, spatial correlation metric that is the Moran's i. So this would mean that i can be written as summation i, i, i over n, and this i is termed, termed as the global Moran's i statistic, okay? And, and clearly, the global Moran's i statistic is an average of the local Moran's I statistics statistics evaluated at locations I in our sample data. Okay, so now we have sort of you know developed this global idea of a global spatial. Uh, you know, autocorrelation metric that is the global Moran's I. And of course, once I have a statistic, the next step for me is, okay, what's, what about statistical inference? What about the confidence intervals on this statistic? Okay, so that's, that's the next natural step. Uh, the next natural step is inference, inference on or for the Moran's I statistic, okay, the inference for the Moran's I statistic. So I have I I which is equal to X I minus X bar over summation I X I minus X bar the whole squared summation J W I J uh, X J minus X bar, okay. Now the next step is to define define a Z score, I'm going to say Z I score, right? So Z score is for, for constructing the 95% the confidence intervals because it's Z for every I, because I'm looking at one as I at location I, I'm calling it Z I score for the lo local Moran's I statistic I I. Z I, is going to be equal to i i minus expectation of i i divided by the standard deviation of i i that is the variance of i i square root okay now this is a standard standard definition for any 
you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, statistic for which we want to, uh, you know, conduct statistical inference. The question is, how do we construct these entities? Expectation II, where do these come from? Right. So to construct them, we have a computational module, right? So I'm going to say expectation of II and the variance of II are computationally evaluated. Evaluated. Okay. So there are several steps. So we, I'm going to go over these steps. The first step is to hold value or location fixed at location i. So I have a data set, okay. I have a data set. Here is my data set, okay. There are the locations i, j, k, l. So these are the locations for which I have data observed over an irregular lattice, okay. So the data are, you know, irregularly spaced and all that. And each location that I observe the data can be thought of as location i. So I'm going to go at, so for, for example, if, if these were groundwater values, then every i I'm going to observe groundwater values, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go at location i and I'm going to fix the value of groundwater level at that location. That's step one. What's step two? Step two is randomly permutate, random permutate or permute remaining n minus 1 uh, values, uh, right? What does it mean random permute uh, n minus 1 value? So I have fixed, I have fixed the value at location i, right? For all other locations, I am going to now randomly assign the values for the remaining n minus 1 values. So I have my bag of n values, right, at different locations. I am going to pick one and hold it constant. The remaining n minus 1 in my bag, I am going to randomly assign them to all the other locations. Okay. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a Monte Carlo, right? So it's a simulation. That is a, that is what I am trying to do. Right. So say I have a sequence of values, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Let's say I have five location data for five locations, and this is the bag of values I have. Right. Let's say I go to location 3 and I fix the value at 6. Okay. So I go to location 3 and I fixed my value at 6. Now for the remaining, I have values 2, 4, 8, and 10 sitting in a separate bag. This, these are the ones that I have not fixed. I have not held them fixed. So what I'm going to do is now with replacement, I'm going to randomly just assign these values at different locations. Okay. I'm, I'm somehow simulating a process of generating the data. Okay. Let, let's say this is one, you know, such construction. With this new data set, you know, now with the new sort of, you know, uh, spatial setting, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute, compute II, okay. So I'm going to compute II. And now this is the, this activity I will do for every location I, okay. For every location I, I go in, I hold, hold the value fix and then I, you know, uh, 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 you know, randomly assign the remaining values to all other locations and then I compute my II, right? For each permutation and each permutation basically means location because the permutation is tied to location, right? So when every time I permute, I'm basically at a location I, I plus 1, I minus 1, I plus 2 and so on and so forth, okay? Now, third step is to repeat uh, steps 1 and 2, steps 1 and 2, so I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, many times. I'm going to say, say m equals 500 times. Let's say I repeat these steps 500 times. I've really simulated the process of spatial construction in the data in every possible way, right? And as step 4, I will get the mean and standard deviation 
of i is drawn from 500 iterations okay the set of i is now i have for each you know each of these iterations i'm going to collect them get the mean value get the standard deviation right and 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 also i can draw confidence intervals Uh, you know in terms of the fifth and the 95th percentile values all right so so basically what I have done is that I've gotten this mean this mean relates to this expectation II the standard deviation here relates to this variance of II square root right but I've now not I've not gotten to them analytically rather I've gotten them computationally or using by using simulations right now all of this is done on the software we don't really do it and in the next module we are going to actually transition and start doing these things right what what is important is to know what the software is doing behind the scenes so that if we see some results which are you know which we feel are you know something that we didn't expect then we can we can at least try and address those things okay so the output output uh, on you know arc map or arc gis something that we are going to start as the next right next module after this lecture is going to sort of provide me what is called as a cluster and outlier analysis of moran's i uh, based on a five color scheme okay it's basically going to give me you know once i calculate more anxiety the output will have five a five color scheme right and that scheme will have five categories basically in different colors which says it will say not significant uh, high 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 low low high and the next you can guess is the low low category right and it'll say when it says high high and low low it's going to call it a cluster cluster that agrees with positive spatial correlation of nearby values right and high low and low i high are going to be you know identified as outliers and some of those are going to be in, not not statistically significant so the Moran's I globally is not going to provide me, you know, I have a global statistic, but locally you may not have spatial correlation, spatial dependence in data in some regions and it, you may have it for other regions, right? So, so this kind of distinction is directly, you know, feeding, you know, I will say feeds directly into the tutorials on RGIS. And, and, and last thing I want to talk about in this part of the lecture is the Geary C statistic. Now, the Geary C statistic, you know, looks pretty similar, by the way, to the Moran's I statistic. It's given by n minus 1, capital N is the size of the data, summation I, summation J. So, instead of just summation J, we have summation I and J. Row standardized weights, xi minus x bar the whole square divided by 2 summation J. Wij uh, summation i xi minus x bar the whole squared. Okay, now you know we know that Wii is equal to zero for every i, right? And the interpretation I'm going to provide the interpretation here is that Geary C is inversely proportional or proportional proportional to Moran's I. So that means if Moran's I provides a signal of a positive correlation, then Geary C is going to provide a, you know a lower value. So if Moran's I is higher, Geary C is going to be lower. Right? C I can is always greater than zero, but you know it 
it is unbounded on the higher side, right? So it can, you know, technically go to infinity. When ci is less than 1, that is to say that ci is between 0 and 1, then it represents a, a increasing positive spatial autocorrelation. Positive increasing spatial autocorrelation as ci is decreasing and whenever ci is greater than 1 right that means you know ci is more than 1 and okay then it will represent situation of increasing negative spatial autocorrelation as ci is increasing all right so as ci basically increases overall you can you can think about it as a measure of decreasing uh, positive spatial autocorrelation in fact when ci is greater than 1 you can uh, think of that situation as a uh, as one of uh, you know a uh, 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 negative spatial autocorrelation okay some notes of caution okay first both Moran's I and Geary's C are exploratory statistics. Okay. We can at best talk about correlations. We can't really talk about causations. We can't say the that an entity in a neighborhood is causing behavior at, at, at the location of interest. No, they are just associate. So they are merely explorations. And both these statistics assume that the underlying processes are same. So that is, they assume stationarity, okay? Assume stationarity. And, you know, the way sort of this has been interpreted is that, you know, they assume that, uh, you know, a, a, a given data set, given data set is in a spatial equilibrium so it, in a way that there is no transitory processes in the underlying data that we are looking at so we are looking at land use transitions then this statistic can be problematic okay and finally something that i have already said is that these statistics are uh, are strictly univariate Right, so they are univariate only. They have no utility in multivariate analysis that you've already seen with, uh, you know, spatial regressions. Okay, so with that, this is an introduction of the Moran's I mainly. I've given you some notes of Geary's C. Moran's I is sufficient for our purposes in this course and for most applications, and it's a far more popular statistic today. It's based on the spatial weights. So if you don't have a definition of spatial weights, you can't really get to a Moran's I. Right, and I'm ending this lecture at this part of the lecture with a caution, some cautionary notes. And I want to sort of drive a point home that you know we have more sophisticated tools at our disposal in terms of the variogram models in order to infer upon spatial autocorrelation. So perhaps even though this tool is available, perhaps we have a more advanced or fundamental understanding of how to measure uh, spatial autocorrelation for very sophisticated, uh, you know. Uh, uh, surfaces okay uh, with that I'm going to end this part of uh, you know uh, the first part of lecture 20 uh, we'll have a very short second part where we'll introduce hypothesis testing uh, for spatial regression models and uh, then we'll move right on to the tutorial so thank you very much for your attention mm -hmm.